Hey folks, in this video, let's have a little bit of fun and throw logic and practicality out the window and try and design the ultimate camera system. Now, let's start out with full frame. I'm gonna go through brand by brand and then do my ultimate 35 mil monster. And I want this to be a conversation. So in the description below, put together what would be your ultimate. Of course, it has to be within reason. No point saying you want a 1000 mil f 1.2 prime lens that fits in your pocket. But if you could just have anything that you wanted. So Canon, I would start out with the R3 body, vastly up upgrade the EVF on it. Put the sensor up to about 45 megapixels, but keep that backside illuminated technology, keep the autofocus that it has. And I would give it an option to go to 18 megapixel full sensor readout at an even faster frames per second. Then let's lower the price of the R3 to about $4,500 and put this one, the R, whatever you want to call it, RX, let's call it, at around six, six and a half thousand dollars. That puts it $500 or $1,000 above the Z9, about the same as an A1 and where it really should be in the lineup. What would your ultimate Canon be? For me, for Sony, we have to start out with the A1, although the new A7 V also looks pretty fantastic. I'd take the A1 sensor, A autofocus system and processor. I'd mix in the video capabilities of the A7S 3 I'd also probably put in that new AI learning autofocus from the A7R5 and then throw away all of the buttons, body design, menus, ergonomics completely of the camera and just take anything from Canon and Nikon, replace it, and there you would have the ultimate Sony camera. I'd also upgrade the CF Express A to a Type B, which is faster, more available, and overall per megabyte actually cheaper. In terms of ergonomics, actually, why don't we forget Canon and Nikon and go back to something a little bit like the A99 Mark II. That was pretty nice. Now for the Nikon range, of course, this is my forte, this is my lifeblood. I've thought about this a lot. The Z9 is amazing, but there are still things that I would do to improve it. So start out with the Z9, then I would give it the EVF from the Sony A1. I would triple the buffer size on this one. I would add raw pre-release capture. I'd like to see them put, maybe it could have one CFB in there, but then go to having a really high speed one terabyte SSD in there as the second or third backup option. I'd like them to put backup video recording either as a proxy or full res onto the second media to have the pre-release record that they have be available as raw now, even if it's at a lower frames per second. Let's have that new high res zoom that they've added for video be able to go anywhere in the screen, not only into the center. Let's sprinkle in the best of Canon and Sony's autofocus to fill in the gaps on the Z9 to make it an overall monster. Then let's take some of the weight savings that the Canon R3 has to lighten this one down. At the same time, let's reduce the size on this 51.2, maybe to something in the ballpark of the Sony one. And what the hell, let's make the mount even 5% larger than it is, so it opens up even more possibilities and really the option down the track to potentially put a larger sensor into this series of cameras. And let's triple the output so that we can clear all of the back orders that are still out there. If you're a Nikon shooter, let me know what you would do to design your ultimate one and make sure you check out my Nikon mirrorless setup guide. It takes you through every camera in the system, how to get the most out of them, how to set them up, customize them, all of that good stuff. Now, having looked at Canon, Sony, and Nikon, what about the ultimate hybrid? If we just wanted one camera to rule them all that would make Peter Jackson happy. Let's take the very best of Sony and Nikon sensors, obviously a lot of overlap there historically, a blend of all three of their uh, autofocuses. Let's keep the Z9 card options, but again, add that SSD in there, add the A1 EVF, Canon or Nikon's ergonomics, all of Nikon's custom button layouts, for me, they just work perfectly, and use the Nikon Z mount. Actually, I've just desired, designed what I said for the Z9 already, aren't I? So ultimate camera if you made all of those changes that I'm asking for. Now whilst we're at it, why don't we also design the ultimate tripod, something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Now if you're in studio or on location where you're not going to be moving around a lot, 
Stability is going to be the number one thing. And if it's, for example, video, its stability isn't just how well it's planted to the ground and that there's no wobble, but how well built out the heads are. Take a look. We have three or four different video tripods. This is the biggest one. It's so heavy and it goes up over my head, but the, the, the head of it is so stable and fluid, you can get the smoothest shots. Likewise, yeah. if you're gonna be doing something with like 800 mil lenses and rapid movement, you might want a gimbal head and again, really heavy duty and something that's going to go up really high so that you don't have to be crouching down at all as you're going. But if you're doing travel, small, light, good compression ratio, and weight are the most important things. If you saw my recent video on this guy from Hapi, travel tripod that is pretty incredible. It's like $300 on Kickstarter from $400 regular price, but it outperforms easily the $750 travel tripod I had been using. You basically wanna get something that's going to fit in your carry-on luggage that weighs as little as possible and is gonna be stable enough to do most of the jobs that you want. Having something this big and heavy, it's gonna get left in the car all the time and you're not actually going to use it. If I was going to, I went through the video and gave my honest thoughts on this. The only ways that I would improve it would be to basically give that a bigger knob and then it's pretty much ideal for travel work. So if you're in the market for a travel tripod, check that out below. Hey, we are not sponsors of this video, but they did send me this tripod for free, sponsoring the first video I did on it. The Kickstarter only has a week left. That's why I wanted to share that with you. Don't worry, APS shooters. Of course, I haven't forgotten you. We have to start out with the Fuji. No offense, Nikon, Canon, Sony shooters, but when it comes to APS-C, I think Fuji are just ahead of the pack. They have such great offerings on the market. It actually made it difficult for me. I don't know if I would wanna start out with an X-Pro3 or something like the X2H as my starting point. I'd probably go a hybrid, go for the overall more rangefinder style layout of the X-Pro3, but keep the media options of an SD and a CF Express B that the X2H has. Have the video chops of this one, Let's grab the button layout of the newly announced X-T5, maybe add in its IBIS as well, and we'll grab the viewfinder from the X-H2 and upgrade the rear screen to whatever's best in market. And I think you would have a fair monster of an APS-C camera there. Great range of lenses already. I'd like to see even more support out there. Sigma have three primes for the mount. It would be cool to see more come out as well. But I think that would be a fairly epic camera, the one APS-C to rule them all. Now, medium format. We're talking baby crop medium format because that's what I have the most experience shooting with rather than the real big boy medium formats like phase one and stuff. They're almost perfect anyway if you could just reduce the price by about 75%. Now looking at these guys, same sensor inside. I'm sorry Fuji, there's some things I love about them, but I just can't go with this body and ergonomics. Let's start out basically with the X2D as is, but from this, let's steal the changeable EVF. If there was a way to elegantly have that module be changeable on this so that you could have different ones, it's a great idea. Not that Fuji have capitalized on it by offering all kinds of different ones yet, but the ability to upgrade what's in there or have potentially different ones for different applications, I think is a really cool idea. But the X2D is so close to being the ideal crop medium format camera for me. We don't have too much to do. Having said that, this is pie in the sky stuff, so let's go to town. I would keep the stabilization, the dynamic range and the image quality as they are. I don't need an extra 50 megapixels, keep it where it is. I would make the screen articulate further. It currently goes about 75 degrees up and not at all down. So I'd like to see it go up and down. If it didn't go side to side, well, if we're doing pie in the sky, 75 in each direction, 90 up and down would be absolutely ideal. This is a dream. 
if they could put a mechanical in-body uh, shutter as well as the leaf shutter in the lens option, that would really open things up. Look at something like a Leica S3. Yes, that's a gigantic camera, but you have the option then of getting central shutter lenses or not. So you have the cheaper or more expensive option, although all of those Leica lenses are way more than even Hasselblad ones. But then when you want to adapt lenses, you have the ability to use the in-body mechanical. So I will give it an extra quarter of an inch to put a mechanical shutter in the body. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. I would like to see the Fuji's level of eye detection and autofocus tracking capabilities. You know what? Let's forget that. I've said it before, but the idea that medium format can't focus like full frame because it's got so much glass to move around, it's just not true. This is by far the biggest lens in the Hasselblad range and it's the same size as the 50 mil. Most of the Hasselblad lenses are this big. It's just not the case. Imagine someone saying that uh, full frame can't focus as well as APS-C because full frame has so much more glass to move around than APS-C. It's nonsense. It's just to do with how much R&D has been invested in the technology. So let's put A1, Z9, R3 level autofocus in this guy as well. Why not? If it doesn't have to use it if you don't want to. And whilst we're at it, Let's put the video capabilities that this camera is capable of in there. It can be in a sub menu. It doesn't have to get in your way. We're just throwing it out there anyway. So for those who want it, it would be there. For those who don't, you don't have to use it. Finally, put the GPS back in the body that was ripped out from the X1D Mark II and we would have a pretty amazing rounded out camera here. I would also like to see that they build out their new range of these new V lenses are much further. This is the 80 mil, their fastest prime lens. You can see it's so much bigger and heavier than the new guys. So I'd like to see new portrait lenses come out for the mount, as well as at least one new zoom. The old zoom is spectacular, but so big and heavy. It's just, I mean, it's so off balance when you've got such a tiny little camera. So that's kind of a system issue rather than just a camera issue, which would be a whole second video, how we would like to design an entire camera system. So whether it is APS-C, full frame or crop medium format, leave me a comment and let me know what would be your ultimate design. Keep some semblance of reality in there so it could potentially be done. Of course, we know manufacturers are not in the business of giving you absolutely everything that's cutting edge, state of the art, all in one package. They've got the next two or three generations of cameras already planned out and in the works, but it's kind of a fun game to play. And out of the cameras that are currently on the market, or maybe even currently on the table, which would be your go-to camera? Love to hear your thoughts. Comments below. I'll see you soon.